The cleaners have always worked very carefully, but in the summer the dust returns as soon as you stop cleaning. So when the front doorbell rang, I was wearing an apron and using a turkey baster. Through the lace curtains, I could see the figure of a young man waiting on the porch, so I opened the door to let him in from the summer heat. Can I help you? I asked. I'm looking for Sarah Cannon, he said. I'm Mrs. Sarah, I answered. What can I do for you? No, he said. I'm looking for Sarah Cannon, the lawyer. It's me, dear, I answered. Come inside. I think now is the time to introduce myself. I'm Sarah Cannon, a family law attorney in Atlanta. Nowadays, of course, the bulk of family law work is, of course, divorce. Many lawyers do not like this kind of work. They think it is unsightly. But when a marriage ends, I've seen a lot of good people suffer, and not just emotionally. I think if I can help protect some poor spouse legally and financially, then I'm doing her, and it's usually her, not him, a real benefit. I've been doing this for a long time. I won't say how long because a lady is not obliged to tell her age, but I can say that I remember watching the Kennedy-Nixon televised debate, if that tells you anything. If you've been able to stay in a profession like law as long as I have, then you're either pretty good or a millionaire with a hobby. I won't brag, but I'm not a millionaire. My office is actually located on the first floor of my house, which is near Piedmont Park, if you're familiar with Atlanta. My late husband and I bought this house many years ago, and I've been here ever since. I like having an office at home. It makes commuting easier, which is important in a city with traffic like Atlanta. In any case, after I cleared the air to this confused young man who came to see me this morning, I led him through the French doors into my office and directed him to a sofa against one of the walls. Once he was settled in, I asked him, How should I introduce you? He smiled at my greeting and answered just as formally, I am Mr. Stephen Markham. Walking over to the small refrigerator I had built into the closet, I asked, Well, Mr. Markham, would you like to join me for a glass of sweet iced tea? It's perfectly refreshing on a hot day, especially with one of these sugar cookies I baked. While he took a glass of sweet tea and took a sugar cookie, I looked at him carefully. He was about 20 years old. I realized that he was left-handed by the way he held a plate of tea and cookies in his right hand. His hands also showed that whatever his income was, it certainly did not involve physical labor. He was good-looking, but not a movie star, a little taller than average, and seemed to keep himself in shape. I'm glad it wasn't complete. It saddens me to see so many young people carrying around excess weight. He had a sensitive face, but today he looked deeply concerned. Well, I said, what brings you here today? This is my wife, he answered sadly. She wants a divorce. Excuse me for a moment, dear. I think someone should join us in this conversation. I left my office and went to another office, which used to be the living room. As I peered through the door, Emily Meerweather looked up from her computer, expectant. Miss Emily, I said, I have a potential client in my office. Would you like to join us? Yes, ma'am, she replied like an obedient girl. As I stood up, I thought again what a lovely young lady she was, tall and slender, with brown hair pulled back with a simple ribbon. Her sleeveless summer dress emphasized her femininity. I thought highly of Emily. She comes from a good family and recently graduated from Agnes Scott College. I hire all my assistants from my alma mater because they are all well-mannered, educated young women. Plus, this seems like a good way to repay the college for the excellent education it gave me. Emily was not a lawyer. This is not what I needed. A family law practitioner like me doesn't really need a legal assistant because family law doesn't require a lot of legal research. But someone who is sincere and ambitious, with a quick mind and a kind heart, can be very helpful doing other types of research, especially with all the blogs, tweets, social media, and who knows what else that passes for communication today. I found it helpful to have Emily present at the first interview. Since she was about the same age as our potential client, she might have a different point of view than someone as old as me. At the same time, listening to her assessment of our client gave me more insight into Emily. You can tell a lot about a person based on how he sees others. As we walked back into my office together, I noted with approval that the young man stood up as we entered. 
I always appreciate good manners. They are not very common these days. Mr. Markham, allow me to introduce you to my assistant, Miss Emily Meerweather. Miss Meerweather, this is Stephen Markham. He is seeking our assistance in connection with a possible divorce. Emily nodded modestly. After we were all seated, I asked Mr. Markham to tell us the details of his situation. The young man began to give a complicated account of his marriage to his beautiful wife, Lola, whom he married straight out of college, their only child, Anita, to whom he was very attached, and the unexpected divorce filing that came like a thunderbolt, in the middle of a clear sky. Moreover, shortly after the first collision, Mr. Markham told us that he was served with a restraining order prohibiting him from contacting or coming within 200 meters of his wife and daughter until all legal matters were resolved. Initially, his story sounded depressingly familiar. After all, most of my practice involves unhappy marriages. But I frowned when I heard about the restrictive order because it suggested the possibility of violence, which I would not expect from this polite young man. Clearly, there was more here than met the eye, or at least my tired old eyes recognized it. After he finished his story, I stood up a little and moved in my chair. Mr. Markham, I must tell you that the majority of my clients are women, not men. As a rule, in most cases that I take on, my client is the one who initiates the divorce, and my job is to make sure that she gets what she gets. I am not drawing any conclusions about your situation, but since it's outside the scope of my normal practice, I need a little time to decide whether to take your case. If you come to my office tomorrow at this time, I will inform you of my decision. With that, I stood up from my seat, making it clear that the interview was over. He also stood up, but it was clear from his expression that he was surprised and upset by my answer. Um, well, I thought lawyers accepted any clients that came to them, he countered. Some of them do, Mr. Markham, I answered sternly, but I'm not one of those lawyers. Okay. Here he paused and then smiled. I heard that you are the toughest... I mean, the best divorce lawyer in town, so I guess I'll take the risk of coming tomorrow. You are kind enough to give me a positive opinion, Mr. Markham. See you tomorrow. And when you come, I added, be sure to bring with you a copy of the documents you were served with. If I take your case, I will need them. He blushed, realizing that he had to bring the papers with him today, then shook my hand and said, Well, have a nice day, Mrs. Cannon. Have a nice day, Miss Merweather, and walked away. After he left, I turned and raised my eyebrows at Miss Emily. Well, child, what is your first impression of our visitor? Without hesitation, she replied, He doesn't seem like the kind of man who would force his wife to seek a divorce. He seems good-natured and very well-mannered. It seemed to me that his concern for his daughter was sincere. She paused and then suddenly blurted out, and he's handsome, too. With these words, she blushed and looked down. I agree he's an attractive guy, I said soothingly. But when a wife suddenly seeks a divorce, there's usually a good reason. And when she feels the need to get a restraining order, that's a bad sign. So, before you get too carried away by his good looks and good manners, I want you to do a little research on the Internet. See if you can find any clues about what Mr. Markham is really like. I need it. This afternoon so that you and I can discuss this together and I can make a decision about representing him. Humbly, Emily said, Yes, Mrs. Sarah, and hurried to her computer. After she left, I tidied up the tea glasses and uneaten sugar cookies. While I was cleaning up, I thought to myself, Young Markham was right about at least one thing. Most lawyers have little choice. They take the clients who come to them. Worse, some lawyers have to hunt for clients like angry birds pecking at random accidents. And the worst thing in my book is the so-called lawyers who advertise their services like some loudmouth at a carnival offering to show a bearded lady. You're a lucky spinster, Sarah Cannon. You've been doing this long enough and good enough to be able to choose the people you represent. And with even more luck, you might be able to bring a little justice to this world. I said amen to that last thought and returned to my desk. An hour or two later, while I was reviewing another case, there was a soft knock on my office door, 
and Emily poked her head inside. Can I come in, Mrs. Sarah? I found some information about Mr. Markham. I waved her in, and she sat down in front of my desk, carefully adjusting the skirt of her lady-style dress. She had a large stack of papers that she had apparently printed off from the Internet. She began arranging her printouts into neat piles based on the diagram she had made for herself. I loved seeing how much energy she put into the task I gave her. Wow, I said. You must be really taken with Mr. Markham's appearance. I can see how motivated you are. Ignoring my banter, she took her plan and got to work. Here's what I've found so far. He was born in Nashville, but his family moved to the Atlanta area when he was in elementary school. He graduated from Emory University with a major in art. That was about six years ago, so he should only be five years older. Than me. He's an artist, and his paintings have begun to attract some interest locally. He hasn't had any big sales yet, but after his last exhibition at the Centennial Park Olympics, he got good reviews from a critic who writes for the journal Constitution. He is married, at least for now, to Lola Markham, née Martinez, formerly of Miami Beach. They apparently met in college and married immediately after graduation. As he mentioned, they have one daughter, Anita, who is now three years old. She paused in her narration, looked up, and added, I saw her picture. She's cute. He has no arrests, no complaints, no warrants, Emily continued, not even a traffic ticket. Before the restraining order was issued, the police had no record of him at all. Very good, I said. Now what can you tell me about Mrs. Markham? Emily pulled another stack of papers from her stack and turned to what appeared to be a biography page from a corporate website. She's the vice president and senior account manager for the Atlanta office of Hamilton Johnson, which is the largest publicly traded PR firm in the country. She started there as an intern while she was in college, then went full-time after graduation and has been there ever since. She is currently directly responsible for many large clients in the metro area. Emily handed me the paper so I could look at her photo, and I couldn't help but blink. Back in my day, we would have called Lola Markham a sex bomb. Her curly dark hair hung below her shoulders, framing her striking face. Even in her sharp corporate suit, it was clear that she had her figure in all the right places. Very beautiful. I remarked. If you like that guy, Emily muttered disapprovingly. Hmm, what do you know about her life outside of work? Emily pulled out another stack of printouts that appeared to be from Lola's Facebook page. There was a long list of memberships and activities, along with a selection of thumbnail photos showing Lola at various parties, events, charity events, and the like. It's hard to say where her work ends and her personal life begins. She really goes to a lot of places, Emily noted. She paused, then added, I find it interesting that there are no photos of Stephen on her page or of her daughter either. Let's not jump to conclusions, honey, I said. This could be related to her work or a desire to keep her personal life private. Well, maybe, but if I had a husband as sweet and talented as he seems, I would want to show him off. As she said this, Emily blushed again and hastily added, and her daughter. You seem to have a little admiration for this guy. I smiled. Just don't let it cloud your judgment. Emily avoided looking at me. However, I continued, I have to agree with you that Mr. Markham seems an unlikely candidate to be an unfaithful husband, and I think he is even less likely to pose a physical threat to Mrs. Markham or their daughter. This makes me think there's more to the story than we've heard so far, so maybe I'll take his case after all. Oh, I'm so glad, Mrs. Cannon, Emily exclaimed. The next day, Stephen Markham again knocked on the door of the old house that served as my office. Come in, darling, it's too hot to stand outside, I said, letting him into the hallway. When we entered my office, Emily was already sitting on a chair with her hands demurely folded in her lap. She looked up and said sweetly, Nice to see you again, Mr. Markham. My pleasure too, Miss Miraweather he replied with a smile. I saw that she was glad that he remembered her name. Let's get started, I said, sitting down on the other end of the couch from Mr. Markham. As I told you yesterday, I usually represent the female side in family disputes. However, Emily and I found some points in your situation that aroused our curiosity. Accordingly, 
I think I will make an exception in your case and represent you, Mr. Markham, if you still want it. A look of relief appeared on Stephen's face, and he began to express his gratitude. I quickly stopped him. Don't thank me now, young man. I haven't done anything yet to deserve your gratitude. Leave it until I actually do something useful. He nodded in understanding, but I could clearly see how relieved he was that I would represent him. Well, now that I have decided to represent you, I continued, I would like your permission to call you Stephen. When he nodded quickly in agreement, I continued, and you can call me Sarah. Thank you, Miss Sarah, he said politely. Now, Stephen, the first thing I would like to do is look at the documents that were served on you, as well as the restraining order. I hope you brought them with you. Stephen quickly pulled out a sheet-sized stack of legal documents from the inside pocket of his summer suit. He gave them to me. It didn't take me long to realize that the divorce suit was a standard template. It looked as if it had been copied from a law textbook. The restraining order was also unremarkable, so I moved on to an offer to divide the property. Well, well, I commented. It sounds like Mrs. Markham wants your house and everything in it. She wants the basic right to raise your daughter, and she wants you to pay child support. It looks like she wants to take everything she can get. Stephen's face again took on the expression of sadness and puzzlement that it had yesterday. If she takes all this, it will practically ruin me, he complained. I won't have my own place to live or to paint, and I'll practically lose Anita. He lowered his head in disbelief. I just don't understand why she became so mean to me. I've always been nothing but loving towards her. Regrettably, Emily began to stroke his hand. Well, well, Stephen, nothing has been decided yet. In chess, this would only be the opening move. The game is far from over, I encouraged him. But there is one thing that still bothers me, and that is the restraining order. What did you do to get your wife to seek police protection? I asked. Stephen blushed a little, this time from anger rather than shame. That was bloody weird. Oh, forgive me, Miss Sarah. I waved my hand, inviting him to continue. It was weird as hell. I was meeting with Roger Every, my agent, to discuss some paintings that I was hoping to sell. As we sat talking, some man I'd never seen before came up to me and asked if, Is it me, Stephen Markham? When I confirmed it was me, he handed me some documents and told me I had received a lawsuit. When I opened them and saw that it was a divorce lawsuit from Lola, I was just stunned. More, I urged him. Of course, I cut short my meeting with Roger and rushed home to find out what was going on, Stephen continued. But when I arrived, the door was locked and my key wouldn't fit. I started knocking on the door and then I heard Lola inside. She didn't open the door, so I had to shout for her to hear me. Everything she told me was that I can't go in and that I just have to walk away and let the court sort it out. Stephen looked at us helplessly. I was amazed. I couldn't go into my own house. Then I thought about Anita, and when I asked Lola where she was, she told me I couldn't see her until this was all over. I guess when I was a little I lost my temper because I started knocking on the door and threatening to break it in. Suddenly, before I knew what was happening, the policeman grabbed me by the arm and dragged me away from the house. He told me that, if I didn't leave immediately, he would have no choice but to arrest me. I was extremely angry and upset, but I was brought up to respect the law and I definitely didn't want to get arrested. So I ended up leaving and going to my brother's. The next day I got this restraining order, he finished. What did you do after that? I nudged him. Well, I talked to my brother and he told me I needed a lawyer and fast. When I told him I didn't know any lawyers, he said, you're the best damn, oh sorry, best divorce lawyer in the city, and I better come to you quickly to ask if you will take my case. I guess I should make some peach cobbler to thank your brother for such a good recommendation, I said with a smile. Setting the legal papers aside, I looked at Stephen and Emily. Before we can do anything, I need more information to work with. Emily, I need you to take Stephen to your office and find out everything you can from him. Find out about his life story, his family and his friends and acquaintances. What are you looking for, Miss Sarah? Emily asked. I can't say for sure because I don't know. I'll know it when I see it, I explained. Emily didn't look convinced, but I knew she'd try anyway. I saw how much she wanted to help Mr. Markham. 
Then, I continued, when you've done that, Stephen, I want you to tell Emily everything you know about Lola, her business, her leisure time, her acquaintances, everything. And don't worry if you forget some details or don't know something. Emily is a miracle at finding information on the Internet. And if you work together, I'm sure she'll find it. So get to work, you two, and please stick with it, no matter how long it takes, because the longer this goes on, the longer it will be before Stephen can reunite with Anita. I think they understood the urgency because they looked at each other and nodded. Miss Sarah, Emily said, smiling shyly, we'll do it. She took Stephen's hand and led him to her office. As the two young men walked through the French doors, already chatting animatedly, my thoughts returned to the moment when Stephen was served with first the divorce papers and then the restraining order. Well, I know one thing for sure. Lola Markham is a great event planner, I thought. She planned her ambush on Stephen down to the minute, and she had everything set up, from the man serving the documents to the locksmith to the policeman who happened to be nearby when Stephen returned home. And she must have also arranged for her lawyer to file for a restraining order. I will remember not to underestimate her, I decided. As I thought about the restraining order and how Lola must have planned ahead for it, it also occurred to me that Lola didn't actually fear for her safety when she requested it. Damn, Stephen is a gentleman. He would never lay a hand on a woman under any circumstances. And Lola knows that better than all of us. Well, if she didn't need protection from Stephen, why did she need a restraining order? Because, I decided, she wanted Stephen to work out the divorce as soon as possible. What's the best way to do this short of taking his little girl away from him? Now I see you, Miss Lola. I thought. You're a crafty little girl, aren't you? One more thing about the divorce suit piqued my curiosity. Lola chose Bolger, Willingham, and Howe, one of the largest law firms in Atlanta, to represent her. Okay, I thought. Except that Bolger, Willingham specializes in corporate law. I'd be surprised if they even have a family law specialist. Indeed, when I looked in the legal directory to find out the name of the attorney who signed the lawsuit, I discovered that Harold Jenkins, an associate, had been an associate partner for only three years out of law school. His specialty is mergers and acquisitions. It seemed to me that the firm had dumped her case on a young lawyer, hoping to impress the partners. Hmm, I thought. Lola would have had to ring a lot of doors to get Bolger, Willingham, and Howe to take her case. Why did she do that? Perhaps she hoped such a powerful firm would force Stephen to submit. I grinned. It will be fun. Now that I had his name and number, I picked up the phone and called Mr. Harold Jenkins to request a preliminary meeting to discuss the terms of the divorce. Jenkins politely told me that his schedule was quite busy, but he thought he could arrange a meeting early next week. Thank you for your kindness, young man, I told him. I look forward to our meeting. Over the next few days, Stephen and Emily worked hard on their assignment. Every time I walked past her office, they sat leaning towards each other, talking about something important. Emily typed queries into her computer as Stephen leaned closer to see what she found. Twice, their research extended well beyond work hours, and they went out to grab a bite to eat together, only to return to the office later for another round of work. Are you sure you're not writing a biography of Stephen? I joked once, smiling. Oh, no she replied, blushing again. She seemed to be doing this more and more often. But you said that every little thing can be important, so I try to find out as much about him as possible. I'm sure you're doing great, honey, I reassured her. Just keep up the good work. On the day of my meeting with Harold Jenkins, I drove to their office on Peachtree Street. The firm occupied the top four floors of a 35-story tower, and the elevator ride seemed like an eternity. When I finally reached the desired floor, I was greeted by a nice receptionist. She led me into a conference room clad in wood and metal that could easily accommodate 20 people. I felt small in this huge space. I think that was their intention. Would you like a Coca-Cola, honey? She asked me politely. No, thanks, I replied. I'll just wait for Mr. Jenkins. I assumed Jenkins would make me wait 15 minutes but he came into the room after 10. I think he was nervous. 
He was dressed in a typical lawyer's suit with gray stripes, a white shirt, and a discreet striped tie. Although he was young, his hair was already thinning, and I noticed that his waist was beginning to stretch out the buttons on his shirt. Mrs. Cannon, he said enthusiastically, I haven't had the chance to meet you in person yet, but I've certainly heard a lot of good things about you. How flattering, I replied. It's also a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Jenkins. Now, he said, sitting down at the head of the table, let's see if we can work out the details of the division of property so that these two people can get on with their lives. Do you mind if I knit? I asked, taking my bag onto my lap. He seemed surprised by my question, so I explained. I found that knitting helps me concentrate. Um, no, of course I don't mind. Please continue, he said. It seemed to me that there was a note of amusement in his voice, but I ignored it and, taking knitting needles and a ball of yarn from my bag, began to knit. He shifted his position in his chair, trying to regain control of the meeting. So, what about the division of property, Mrs. Cannon? He began, but I interrupted him again. Yes, regarding the separation proposal, my client was very surprised by your client's proposal. It seems to be a little one-sided. Oh, no, he responded quickly. We don't think it's unreasonable. Take a custody agreement, for example. It's not unusual for a court to award custody to a mother in a case of such a young child, especially if it's a girl. Yes, of course, I agreed. But my client is saddened by the proposed restrictions on seeing his child. He really misses his daughter and would like to see her much more often than a few weekends and a two-week vacation a year. And now, with the restraining order issued against him, he can't see her at all. Of course, I'm sure the separation is very painful for him, Jenkins said peacefully. And the sooner we get this settled, the sooner we can lift the restraining order and return the dear child to his father's arms. He gave me what I thought was a rather sycophantic smile, and I thought to myself, this is going to cost you. Out loud, I agreed. Getting her back is my client's highest priority. Great, the lawyer said enthusiastically as if the custody issue had already been resolved. Then let's move on to the division of property. I didn't argue. Okay, I said. What about the division of property? Does my client have to lose not only his house, but everything in it? Not at all, Mrs. Cannon. Of course he can have his clothes, shaving supplies, and other personal effects. Jenkins said, smiling as if making a generous concession. We have no problem with that. But what about the furniture and kitchen utensils? Doesn't Lola expect Stephen to have to start over without owning anything? I objected. Jenkins shook his head sadly, but firmly. Mrs. Markham is a woman of taste and sophistication. She has put a lot of effort and time into decorating their home to reflect her tastes, and given the significant difference in their incomes, you must admit that it was she who provided most of the funds for this. When I remained silent, he continued, Under these circumstances, she understandably does not want her work to be, he paused, apparently searching for words, plundered in search of revenge by an offended husband. No, she insists on preserving the integrity of what she created so diligently. Really, I said. However, she can't lay claim to the paintings in his studio, I believe she hasn't even hung any of his work in the house. Couldn't she let him own his own paintings? I must remind you, Mrs. Cannon, that it was my client who set up and financed Mr. Markham's little studio. He paused at my curious gaze, then explained, You know, his art studio. I nodded eagerly. I graduated from Agnes Scott College, Mr. Jenkins. I know what a studio is. Under my breath, I added, And... Unlike you, I know how to pronounce this word correctly. He hurried to continue. Yes, of course. To be honest, Mrs. Cannon, after the unfortunate incident in which Mr. Markham almost went berserk at their home and had to be restrained by the police, Mrs. Markham is extremely reluctant to concede. The transfer of any property for which she has paid, except already discussed, of course. This is interesting, I thought. He anticipated that the question of ownership of the paintings might arise and prepared a carefully formulated answer in advance. Jenkins now insisted, 
feeling his advantage. Mrs. Cannon, I would ask you to impress upon your client that this entire unfortunate matter can be resolved and access to his daughter quickly restored if he will simply sign the offer we have presented. Dragging out these negotiations will only cause more delay and I highly doubt they will change the outcome. I put my knitting in my bag and stood up. Okay, Mr. Jenkins, I will convey your position directly to my client. I believe that we can all meet again for a final resolution in the near future. Very well, Mrs. Cannon, the sooner the better. Now if you'll excuse me, I have one more appointment. With these words, Mr. Jenkins left, a triumphant smile barely hidden on his lips. I went out by myself, not forgetting to thank the receptionist for her kindness. When I returned to my office, Stephen and Emily were eager to find out how the meeting went, so I invited them in to discuss what had happened. After I described my meeting with Mr. Jenkins, the faces of the two young men took on a sad look. I think the whole meeting was useless, Emily lamented. On the contrary, my dear, I would say that the meeting was very fruitful, I corrected her. I learned three things today that I think could be very valuable to us. Really, Miss Sarah? Stephen asked with a puzzled expression. What are these things? The first thing I confirmed was my suspicion that your wife is using your daughter to pressure you into making a quick decision on her terms. Mr. Jenkins was practically rubbing it in my nose, emphasizing the advantage Lola has over you in this regard. Stephen's face darkened. The second thing I learned is that your wife not only insists on preserving everything in your house, she is especially determined to preserve your paintings, I continued. But why should she care about them? Stephen exploded. First of all, they aren't worth that much, and besides, she hasn't shown any interest in my work for a long time. That's a very interesting question, Stephen, I replied. I'd like to know the answer to that, too. When I fell silent, Emily chimed in. You said you learned three things, Mrs. Sarah. What was the third thing? I have learned that Mr. Richard Jenkins is neither a particularly skilled lawyer nor a gentleman, I said, crossing my arms and standing up straight. I will have to ask God's forgiveness for some of the thoughts I had about Mr. Jenkins today. With that, I smiled at them both and asked, Now that I have shared with you what I learned from Mr. Jenkins, would you in turn want to share what you have found out about Mr. Markham and his wife? Emily ran to grab her ever-growing stack of notes and printouts, and they settled shoulder to shoulder on the sofa to report their findings. After a quiet discussion, Emily began her presentation with a summary of Stephen's family and early life. He then took it upon himself to tell how he met and subsequently married Lola Martinez. As they made their presentation, I found it funny to watch how they often finished each other's sentences, eager to show off what they had learned. Very good, I praised them. Have you learned anything else about Mrs. Markham now? Their duet seemed to shift to a minor key as they began to describe Lola's life and career. Clearly, neither of them liked the new topic of discussion, but their negative attitude could not hide the fact that Lola Markham was an impressive young woman. At university, she was active in service organizations, served as president of her sorority, and graduated in the top 10% of her class. Once she started working full-time at Hamilton Johnson, she was promoted from an entry-level assistant, position to vice president and senior account representative, in the time it would take the average new employee to learn how to get to the women's room. When I noticed the speed of her impressive rise in the company, even Emily admitted that Lola was more than just a pretty face. She must be damn good at what she does to get this far, this fast, and the number of large accounts she handles is truly astonishing, she admitted reluctantly. Do you happen to know who they are? I asked. Oh, yes, she replied and after consulting her notes, she began to quickly rattle off an impressive list of major Atlanta companies, institutions, and organizations. Sorry, honey, I interrupted, but did you just say Avery International Art? Is this the company owned by Roger Avery, Stephen's agent? That's right, Stephen confirmed. Actually, it was Lola who introduced me to Roger for the first time. It was a pleasure to have the opportunity to work with such a renowned agent. And here's another connection, Mrs. Sarah, Emily put in. 
Lola also does public relations for Bolger, Willingham, and Howe. What a small world we have, I exclaimed, although I thought to myself that it was indecent for a law firm to hire a PR agency. As they continued, my mind wandered as I tried to remember everything I had learned today. I had many possible scenarios, but nothing concrete that I could rely on. If we wanted to make any progress, I needed to seek outside help. It looked like the two young men in front of me were going to continue their presentation late into the night, so I interrupted them a second time. Sorry for the interruption, but I think it's time for me to reach out to an old friend. I need to get this done before it's too late, so maybe you two should finish for today and we'll continue tomorrow morning. When they left my office, I started looking in my desk drawers. Where did I put my church directory? When Emily and Stephen walked into my office together the next morning, they were surprised to see me talking to an older African-American man they had never seen before. I quickly stood up to introduce them. Mr. Rayford, may I introduce my assistant, Miss Emily Merriweather? She nodded politely, although somewhat hesitantly. And here standing next to her is Mr. Stephen Markham, the client I told you about. Hello, hello, Mr. Rayford nodded affably. Emily, Stephen, let me introduce Mr. Lucius Rayford. He is the man who cleans my offices. Emily and Stephen tried not to show their surprise, but their embarrassment was obvious. Lucius and his wife Mabel are dear friends of mine, I explained. We go to the same church. He agreed to help us. Taking Mr. Rayford's arm, I said, Thank you very much, Lucius. It's so encouraging to know we can count on you. Oh, Mrs. Sarah, you know I would do anything for you, he replied. I'll contact you as soon as I can. Turning to Stephen and Emily, he bowed slightly and said, Nice to meet you, and headed for the door. Give my best wishes to Mrs. Rayford, I called after him. I'll definitely tell you, he promised, and left. A little hesitantly, Emily turned to me. Mrs. Sarah, how can Mr. Rayford help us? I've been friends with Lucius for a long time. I smiled. You'd be surprised what he can do. But for now, we need to be patient, I continued. We have entered the waiting stage. What are we waiting for, Mrs. Sarah? Emily asked uncertainty. I'm not entirely sure, I replied with a smile. I guess I'll know it when I see it. In the meantime, I want you to continue your research. See if you missed anything or if you can spot any other matches. I like continuing to work with Emily, Stephen said, glancing at her. But I'm starting to worry about Anita. When do you think I'll be able to see her again? Everything is in the Lord's time, was all I could say. As it turned out, the time of the Lord came only three weeks later. Mr. Rayford came to see me that afternoon. And when Stephen and Emily entered my office, I had just finished looking through the contents of the large envelope he brought me. Well, well. I said disapprovingly. I wouldn't have thought we'd see something like that, especially so quickly. Yes, Mrs. Sarah, Lucius agreed. It's really something, isn't it? I leaned across the table, hugged Lucius, and kissed his cheek. Thank you for everything, dear. You helped us a lot. I should invite you and Mabel over for dinner soon. That will be wonderful, Mrs. Sarah, he replied. We're looking forward to it. When he left... I turned to Emily and Stephen and smiled. I think we're almost ready for the final stage. As soon as I said this, the phone on my desk rang. I recognized the number on the display and, motioning for Emily and Stephen to stay, I answered the call. Yes, this is Mrs. Cannon. Of course, I'll be happy to wait for Mr. Jenkins. A minute passed, then two. Hello, Mr. Jenkins. How nice to hear your voice again. Yes, I had the opportunity to discuss your client's proposal with Mr. Markham. Yes, I think we are at the point where we can reach a mutually acceptable agreement. Why don't we meet at your office at the earliest convenience for both parties? And this time, Mr. Jenkins, I think all parties must be present so that we can bring this matter to a conclusion. This has gone on too long, I'm afraid, and my client misses his daughter too much. Yes, your office tomorrow at 3 p.m. would be fine, I said raising my eyebrows at Stephen and Emily to make sure they were free, too. Great. Then, Mr. Jenkins, it will be nice to see you. Turning to Emily and Stephen, I said, 
as the great Caesar said, the die is cast. Now before we have our meeting, I need to know if you have found any other information that could change our case. They exchanged confused glances. The way they fidgeted reminded me of a couple of elementary school kids who were eager to please but couldn't answer the teacher's question. Finally, Emily said, Mrs. Sarah, we've spent hours together going over everything over and over again, but all we could find was one minor coincidence that didn't seem to make much of a difference. What is this? I asked. She apparently regretted mentioning this, but she did say, we noticed that Bolger, Willingham, and Howe, and Hamilton Johnson have offices in the same building, but I don't see how important it is. I smiled at Emily and said, It's okay, honey. You and Stephen did a great job. In addition, Mr. Rayford brought to my attention the same coincidence. Emily was silent, but Stephen was direct. What does it matter, Mrs. Sarah? It just made it easier for Lola to visit her lawyer when she needed legal help. You're absolutely right, Stephen but you have to admit that there are too many coincidences in this case. Now, if you'll excuse me, it's late, and I have a lot of work to do until tomorrow afternoon. Why don't you two go get something to eat? See you tomorrow so we can all head to Peachtree Street together. I wasn't exaggerating when I told the young people that I had a lot of work to do. I did this until late at night and all the next and morning to make sure everything was exactly the way I wanted. I was tired but happy with what had been done, and glad that soon we could put an end to this game we were playing. The three of you walked to the offices of Bolger, Willingham, and Howe in complete silence. Between the overwhelming heat outside and the nerves we were all feeling inside, small talk was kept to a minimum. Once again, we were ushered into the sterile, huge conference room where I had met Mr. Jenkins before. Once again, we were kept waiting, this time for a full twenty minutes. He must be very confident today, I thought to myself. At last, Mr. Jenkins made his grand entrance, apologizing for his tardiness insincerely. I'm very sorry for keeping you waiting, he began. I had a long international call. No need to apologize, Mr. Jenkins, I replied with a slight smile. We all know what an important person you are. Jenkins's head lifted for a second. I think he was wondering if I was being sarcastic or just being polite. At that moment, there was a soft knock on the door, and Mr. Jenkins quickly opened it to allow the young woman standing there to enter. Mrs. Cannon, Jenkins said as if he were a TV show host, I don't think you've met Lola Martinez Markham yet. I felt Stephen tense next to me at the sight of his once beloved wife. It won't take him long to forget her, I thought to myself. Leaning across the table, I shook her hand and said, Hello, Mrs. Markham. It's a pity that the circumstances of our meeting could have been different. I thought she was attractive in that shiny way that many young women today acquire, and which, in my opinion, is not so beautiful. She returned my greeting with a small smile and sat down, crossing her legs so that the hem of her short skirt rode up, revealing too much of her thigh. She wore a men's shirt with just enough buttons undone to show off her generous cleavage. She must have dressed that way on purpose to show Stephen what he was missing, I thought wryly. She really wants to hurt him. After I introduced Stephen and Emily, Jenkins seemed to want to take control of the meeting, just like he did last time. But first he turned to me with a patronizing smile and said, I see you have brought your bag with you again, Mrs. Cannon. Will you knit again? I smiled sweetly back at him and said, No, I need my bag for other things today. Having completed these pleasantries, Jenkins spread his hands in a theatrical gesture and said, I would like to begin our meeting by reviewing the proposal that my client has made. I think... Sorry, I interrupted, but I would like to begin our negotiations by reviewing our counter-proposal. Jenkins was stunned, but quickly came to his senses. Oh, of course, Mrs. Cannon, ladies first. We had no idea that your client had an alternative offer. We'd love to hear what you have to offer. Lola gave him an angry look. I don't think she agreed. I ignored their little exchange and started. With regard to the house which Mr. and Mrs. Markham shared, our proposal is that Mrs. Markham vacate it immediately, relinquishing all her title to it in favor of Mr. Markham. What? 
Lola Markham screamed. She looked at Jenkins and screamed, She can't do this. Jenkins quickly put his hand on hers to silence her and then turned to me indignantly. Mrs. Cannon, what could make you think that Mrs. Markham would ever agree to such an outrageous proposal? I ignored him for a moment and went straight to Lola. Mrs. Markham, you are truly an impressive young woman. In just three years, you have achieved the kind of prestige in your field that most people strive for their entire career. You obviously have the beauty, brains, and talent to make it this far. Although Lola was clearly still irritated by the proposal I had just made, I could see that she was receptive to my compliments. Little Daffodil, I thought. However, even with such remarkable qualities, I continued, I think it would be difficult for anyone to achieve so much in such a short time, I paused, without the use of other talents such as these. With that, I took a photograph from the bag on my lap and handed it to her face down. When she turned it over and looked at it, she sighed. Where did you get this? She shouted at me. Jenkins quickly snatched the photo from her hands and stared at it in amazement as he realized what he was seeing. The black and white photograph clearly showed a fairly explicit scene involving Mrs. Markham. Stephen and Emily also gasped when I handed them the duplicates, and Emily began to urgently speak to Stephen in a quiet voice to keep him from any outburst of emotions. But Jenkins had no one to restrain him, and without thinking about the consequences, he burst out, Who the hell is this? This, I said, is Mr. Warren Lewisone, managing director of the Atlanta office of Hamilton Johnson. I assume, Mrs. Markham, that he is your boss. As Jenkins stared at the photograph, dumbfounded, I commented dryly, It sounds like your client hasn't been entirely forthcoming about her reasons for seeking a divorce. Lola began to speak angrily, but Jenkins, to his credit, regained his composure and gave her a steely glare, silencing her. Although this photo seems to be a small office romancy, unfortunately, it is not related to the matter in front of us. The state of Georgia has a no-fault divorce law that does not take into account the reason for the divorce. Any alleged infidelity would be irrelevant in court, Jenkins fumed. Besides, he continued, gaining strength, it is impossible to say when this connection occurred. It may well have happened after Mrs. Markham decided to consummate her marriage. Any relationship arising after notification would be ex post facto. That's all very true, Mr. Jenkins, I admitted. But if you and Mrs. Markham look closely at the setting, you will see that this took place in the offices of Hamilton Johnson in this very building. I believe that if the existence of this relationship and its satisfaction in these territories became known to the directors and shareholders of Hamilton Johnson, they would not be too forgiving. First of all, what they are doing is a clear violation of the corporation's code of ethics, which prohibits any such relationship between a manager and a subordinate. Secondly, they may draw some unpleasant conclusions about the real reason for Mrs. Markham's rapid rise through the ranks. While the meaning of my words settled in the heads of the unfortunate pair opposite us, I offered them a way out. However, I see no need for anyone else to see this photograph or consider its significance, if we all agree to our proposal for the Markham House. Jenkins and Lola immediately began discussing in whispers. Although the words between them were inaudible, the tone of the conversation was quite clear. I looked around to see how Stephen and Emily were doing. Emily, oh my God, was shocked by the photo, but she had recovered and was now doing her best to calm Stephen down. Seeing as she glared across the table, however, I doubted she would want to be friends with Lola Markham on Facebook. Stephen's face was a mixture of pain and anger. Unfortunately, I have seen this combination of emotions on clients' faces many times. Turning to Jenkins and Lola, I interrupted their little discussion by loudly clearing my throat. We now move on to our second counter-proposal. This concerns custody of their daughter, Anita. We propose that Stephen Markham, her father, be given full custody of his daughter and Lola. Markham will have limited visitation rights only at the discretion of the father. Lola and Jenkins were visibly startled, and Jenkins couldn't contain himself. Mrs. Cannon, 
This is impossible. No court would ever grant sole custody to the father if the mother were not behind bars in prison. This is absurd. Funny you should mention that, Mr. Jenkins, I replied calmly. Perhaps you would be so kind as to look at this letter. Again, I took copies of the document out of my bag and distributed them to all parties at the table. The letter was written on the letterhead of a major art dealer in New York and addressed to Mr. Roger Avery. The essence of the letter was an offer to a New York dealer to buy several works by Richard Markham for an extremely large sum. Jenkins's face showed his bewilderment. I don't see how this relates to our discussion this afternoon. Before I could respond, Stephen couldn't hold it in any longer. Wait a minute. This letter is dated more than a month ago. Avery never told me about this. I knew nothing about any deal for the sale of my paintings. Exactly, Stephen, I said. You didn't know about this, but I suspect Mr. Avery may have shared this information with your wife. The lady refused to meet my gaze, so I insisted. I kept wondering why she was so insistent on keeping the pictures of Stephen, even though she had never expressed much interest in them before. This letter offers an answer. Jenkins tried to take the lead again. This is slander, he said loudly. You are making crazy accusations. You have no evidence that my client knew about this letter. You don't even know if there was any fraud involved. Avery could have lost the offer or forgotten about it for all we know. Jenkins had a new thought. Additionally, Avery would not have benefited from any collusion. He would have been paid his commissions from the sale of the paintings, regardless of who owned them. I was thinking the same thing, Mr. Jenkins, I replied, until I saw this. Taking another set of photographs from my bag, I passed them around the room. There was a stunned silence as everyone stared at Lola Markham's latest lovemaking session. This is Roger Avery, Stephen whispered, confirming what everyone else either knew or guessed. I had to wait until the hubbub died down before I could speak again. As before, I turned to Lola Markham. Conspiracy to defraud is a criminal offense, my dear. If I present this letter and this photograph to the authorities, I am sure they will not hesitate to press charges. No! She screamed. You can't prove it. You can't do this to me. I smiled subtly at her. As it turns out, next week I'm having dinner with the state attorney general, who is an old friend of mine. Would you like me to bring this to his attention? Jenkins turned to Lola and shouted desperately, Just shut up! You are only making your situation worse. When her protests died down, I took advantage of the moment of silence. Again, my client and I do not want his daughter to feel the shame of having a convicted felon as a mother. If we can agree on our proposed custody arrangement with full child support from Lola, of course I think we can avoid all the pain of the investigation, trial, and likely verdict. I looked directly at Jenkins and added, would you agree that the court is more likely to grant the father's primary custody request if he has the mother's written consent? Jenkins could no longer look at me or his client. With a defeated tone, he muttered, I'm sure that will be perfectly acceptable, Mrs. Cannon. Well, if we've agreed on our two counter-proposals, there's only one last point left, I continued cheerfully. Oh God, what now? Jenkins groaned. I frowned at his taking the Lord's name in vain, but decided to ignore the blasphemy and continue. The last item to discuss is the bill for the time my firm spent on this case. Given the circumstances which have led my client to seek legal advice, we believe it is only fair that Bolger, Willingham, and Howe foot the bill in full. With that, I pulled a copy of the legal bill out of my bag and pushed it toward Jenkins. When he began to look through it, he turned pale. The hourly rate you are asking is higher than our senior partners, he countered. Then he stopped, as if he understood what I had just said. Wait a minute, he stepped back. You mean you're asking my client to pay your fee, right? You said Bolger, Willingham, and Howe would pay. That was a mistake. I know what I said, young man, and that's exactly what I meant. I expect the law firm of Bolger, Willingham, and Howe to pay this bill in full, I said firmly. It's incredible, Jenkins countered. One law firm does not pay another lawyer's fees. My boss would kick me out of the office if I brought him your bill. Not if you give it to him with it, I said, taking the last photo out of my bag. 
When he looked at the photo, I got the impression that he almost had a heart attack. This is Robert Willingham, our managing partner, he said in amazement. Indeed so, I answered harmfully, and it seems that he also had as much connection with Mrs. Markham as Roger Avery. As an active member of the Georgia State Bar Association Ethics Committee, I know that engaging in sexual relations with a client is grounds for disbarment, I said sweetly. So I suggest you take my bill, along with this photograph, to Robert and ask him to pay it immediately. With that, the three of us stood up to leave. Lola Markham sat crying on the table. She refused to look at Stephen as we walked past. He carefully avoided looking at her, too, I noticed. But there was a grin on his lips as he walked past her. Richard Jenkins sat slumped in his chair, staring at the wall. I think he wondered if his legal career would come to an abrupt end. Opening the door, I turned to him again. One word of advice, Mr. Jenkins. He looked at me, a beaten man. Next time you ask a lady out, don't keep her waiting. I didn't allow any discussion of the day's accomplishments until we were through the chaotic roads of Atlanta and safely back at my office. Then I let the celebration begin. Stephen and Emily danced with each other with joy. I handed out glasses of sweet tea. Emily could hardly contain herself. Oh, Stephen, did you see the look on Lola's face when Mrs. Sarah gave her those photos? But these photographs, Stephen objected. How did you even get them? For them, my dear, we owe our gratitude to Lucius Rayford. They both looked at me in bewilderment. You see, I explained, Lucius Rayford is the owner of one of the largest cleaning companies in Atlanta. His firm is contracted to clean the building that also houses Bolger, Willingham, and Hamilton Johnson. I simply asked him to install a couple of wireless, digital cameras in certain offices and let me know what they picked up. But Roger Avery's office is not on Peachtree Street, Stephen pointed out. How did you get that shot of Lola, um, in action with him? Lucius may not own the only cleaning service in Atlanta, but he is friends with the owners of most of them. He had no problem asking the people who service the Avery building for a favor. How could you know that Lola, uh, was getting involved with all these people? Emily was surprised. I didn't know this, of course, but my suspicions were aroused when you mentioned how quickly she rose to Hamilton Johnson. They have a selection of top graduates for their program. I even know one of them that came from Agnes Scott. However, among so many talented people, only Lola had such a career advancement. I wondered why. But how did you find out about Roger Avery? asked Stephen. I never would have thought about it, I admitted, until Emily pointed out that he was Lola's client. It could have just been a coincidence, but I thought it was strange when you said you were served with court papers at his office. How would a procedural officer know exactly where to be at the right time if Avery hadn't told Lola? And finally, why was Lola so insistent on preserving Stephen's paintings, which, as far as we know, were not known to be of great value? Once I had all this together, I asked Lucius to ask his friend to check Avery's office to see if there was any correspondence with Stephen's name there. And, of course, at that very moment, I asked him to install the camera. What about the old guy at the Jenkins Law Firm? How about him? Emily asked. Oh, Robert Willingham, I said. It was easy. Hiring Bolger. Willingham for your divorce representation is a little like using a hammer to kill a mosquito. This is not only redundant, but also too expensive. The cost of maintaining that monster of an office alone would have sent Bolger Willingham's fees skyrocketing. How could Lola afford such a company, even on her salary? Plus, even though Lola was their PR representative, a large corporate law firm simply wouldn't take on a divorce case under normal circumstances. So I just started looking for unusual circumstances. Guess what? I found them. I smiled. Even so, Emily insisted. Lola started her plan long before Stephen came to your office. This means that it was, um, completed before Lucius could install his cameras. How did you know she would, uh, repeat her act with these three men? Oh, that, I said. I was relying on human nature to help us a little. I don't understand, she said. It's simple. 
The schemer rarely leaves her plans alone. She always has to do one more thing to ensure success. The one thing she did was with Warren, Roger, and Robert. And as for men, I said, with a twinkle in my eye, well, let's just say that once they taste honey, they always want more. Sarah blushed. In the silence that followed, I glanced at Stephen. Again, I saw a mixture of emotions on his face. He was still ecstatic about our victory, but I think I detected a trace of sadness in his eyes. I tried to guess what could be the reason. Don't be sad about Lola, Stephen. I'm sure she loved you when you first got married. But a girl like her loves herself more than any man. When she realized how to manipulate others to achieve her goals, I have no doubt that she thought about trading you for a richer model. I guess you're right, Mrs. Sarah, he replied regretfully. When I married Lola, she seemed like the perfect woman. Now that I've seen what she's really like, I'm just glad she's out of my life. But it's still painful. Of course it hurts, honey, I said. But you're definitely better off without her. Now you just need to find a good woman who will love you for who you are. Before he could answer, I asked him, But now aren't you forgetting something? What do you have in mind? Don't you have a girl waiting at home? I'm sure she's just dying to see her daddy. I smiled. His face instantly lit up. Oh my God, you're right. It all happened so quickly that I almost forgot. He started to walk away, then stopped, turned to Emily and asked hopefully, Would you like to come with me and meet Anita? Emily looked at him sincerely. Oh yes, I really want it. Together they headed towards the door. When they walked to the car, it seemed to me that they were holding hands. I returned to my desk and made a note on my calendar for the next morning to call the Dean of Students at Agnes Scott. It's better to start now, I thought. I have a feeling that I'll soon have to hire a new assistant. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.